Welcome everyone. We're happy to have you. Just getting started here. I'd like to say welcome to Native Plants at Noon. Happy spring. This is our first of two Native Plants at Noon episodes for the month of April. And we're so glad that you're joining us today. We hope you'll meet us back here one week from today for a special Earth Day Native Plants at Noon episode. Deep Roots is excited to be bringing you virtual native plant education all year long through our partnership with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Please continue to join us on the third Thursday of each month for live presentations from the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City. Before we get started, uh, just a quick reminder, um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen or in the comments on the Facebook live feed, and we'll keep an eye on those over there as well. We know we won't get to every single question, but we will do the best that we can, and please feel, to free, excuse me, please feel free to reach out to either myself or the presenters, and we're happy to connect you with answers afterwards. On this lovely sunny day, we are once again joining Alex Daniel and Sydney Ross at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center. As native landscape specialists with the Missouri Department of Conservation, today they're going to do what they do best, and that's talk about plants. Alex and Sydney, thanks so much for being here yet again. Yeah, thank you for having us. Hello. Hello, hello. I'm Alex. I'm Sydney. And we're so happy to talk with y'all today about spring flowering plants that are native to Missouri. But before we begin, we want to plug a really cool book that'll be helpful for y'all to ID plants uh, as you're out in our wild areas. Yeah, so this, this month we are um, plugging Missouri Wildflowers by Edgar Dennison. Um, this is the sixth edition. Um, I believe Sarah's going to put in a link for where you can find this book, but this is a really great beginner book for Missouri wildflowers, for native flowers. And um, it's got great pictures and diagrams and it's by color. So the, the oh, flowers cool. are organized by color. So yeah. it makes it super easy for beginners to pick up. Yeah, and um, so yeah, Sarah's gonna put a link in the chat. You can also find this book here at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center gift shop. Uh, while supplies last so pop on by come visit our beautiful gardens here and uh, pick up a copy for your library yeah. awesome so i'm gonna just do a little flipping around here so sydney what is the first spring flowering plant you're going to talk to us about today yeah so okay i'm really excited about this plant it is called uh fremont's leather flower and this, I will say, this is an especially rare plant in Missouri. Um, it can be found in our glades. It can also be found in a pra uh, like dry glade like prairies in Kansas. Um, but it is Clematis Vermonti is the Latin name. So this is not necessarily a plant that will be easy for y'all to find for your gardens. But I promise we're not just talking about um, endangered species today. So <laughs> come take a look. Go a little closer to you. It's not quite endangered, but it is. Uh, very hard to propagate and well in Missouri it is um it's, oh it is it's rare in Missouri anyway yeah, is what I was yeah for sure for sure but okay so take a look at this so it's called like one of the common names is leather flower and the reason being is the foliage here is very leathery um and, and feel but you can see it has this gorgeous like nodding uh purple bell-shaped blossom um, and the, the way this plant uh, reproduces is by pollinators. So imagine a little bee coming up and pollinating that uh, right there in the center of this flower. Um, so we have a few here, few um, plants here at the Discovery Center. Um, and I, I love how they kind of vary in color. So you see this one is more cream-like, uh, whereas the other one that we saw was purple. Um, and the reason why it's called Fremont's Leather Flower is it's named after General Fremont, who was an American explorer who, who uh, found, quote unquote, his plant. Um, so it was named after him. Um, it, like I mentioned, it does well in glades and prairies. So this plant likes really dry soil. You can see here it's in a pretty dry spot, full sun. 
and it blooms about this time um, and maybe even through May. You can see over here, this one hasn't um, quite bloomed yet. I don't even know yeah. if it has any. It looks like, it, yeah, it should have buds right on the, right inside, in the inside of the flower. That's yeah. kind of cool. To also, could, could I show this yeah. one too? That there's this little one. It's so tiny. It's really small. And so, that one would oh, have come in. Think? That one would have, um, uh, is from seed. Oh. Uh, we would not have put that one right yeah. there. Yeah. So. so I think Alex is mentioning earlier that um, this plant is especially difficult to germinate from seed. Um, we tried it um, a little bit this past year without very much luck. When I was reading about it, I think it takes like two to four months for that seed to germinate, which is an especially long time for a native plant uh, seed to germinate. So uh, we tried unsuccessfully, um, <laughs> but you know, that doesn't mean we won't try again. Uh, but this is just such a cool plant. Um, it's unusual. It is, uh, in my opinion, kind of like a showcase species. So if you're able to get your hands on this in a, um, um, ethical, ethical way, manner. <laughs> in an ethical manner, please do not dig up plants from your conservation areas, little PSA. Um, but if you happen to find this at your local native plant nursery, definitely consider getting it uh, for your garden uh, if you have a full sun dry area. So just wanted to showcase that off the top before we dive into more plants that you can definitely add to your garden and find at your local native place. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the rest of these will be much easier yeah, to yeah. procure. So, that, so that is a clematis, right? That's Sydney? right, yeah. So that's kind of an interesting thing too. Um, so you all probably heard of clematis. Um, you know, they sell a lot of different cultivars of clematis. Some are invasive, like autumn clematis. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the few native clematis to Missouri. And the word clematis means climbing usually. Uh, but this one doesn't climb. It's a little shrubby plant. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of unusual for the name. Yeah, we have our, our the native vining clematis will, is out front in a couple spots in our garden. Mm -hmm. And it has... This a similar structure to the flower, but it's much smaller it, and it is, it is climbing. It's it. so cute. It's gonna be so cute. It's like yes. this, you're saying it's like the same kind of urn shape, like nodding urn shape, but mm -hmm. much tinier. Yeah, we tiny. And uh, you brought you brought up a good point. One of the leading or one of the scariest, in my opinion, um, non-native invasives that we have. Um, starting to really cause a lot of problems in the Kansas City area is the um, autumn, uh, sweet autumn clematis. Sweet autumn clematis. Yeah, and you'll see it all over. It takes over yeah. fence lines and it crowds out native species and it yeah. spreads really, so really prolifically. Do garden centers still sell that? Because Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I know garden centers sometimes sell other invasive species, which and by the way, invasive means a non-native plant that invades um, an environment and does damage to uh, the ecosystem, whether it's yeah. plants, wildlife, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they sell like winter creeper, which is a horribly invasive plant uh, to the United States. So yeah. anyway. Anyway, re replace your sweet autumn clematis with native clematis. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Called virgin's bower as a uh, common name okay. in, in nurseries. So what's our next plant, Sydney? So I don't know if you can get kind of a wide shot. Yes. <laughs> um, we have some wild sweet william um, and Alex can you say the latin name because I suck at latin <laughs> it's phlox divericata phlox divericata in case you're I also suck at latin it. everyone sucks at latin know, don't worry I, about it <laughs> anyway wild sweet william here are these beautiful lavender flowers you can see they have flattened petals um, and these, um, the common name again is Wild Sweet William, and it does have a really nice, subtle floral smell. Um, this is a really great woodland species. Uh, so it, you can find this commonly throughout Missouri woodlands. Um, and it attracts hummingbirds and butterflies like swallowtails, uh, gray streaks, and um, oh, what was it? The, pig, the Western Pygmy Blues, which I'm going to do a little more research on that. Um, I thought that was really cool that it attracts those particular butterflies. But you can see it's got that little opening there for pollinators to stick their little tongues in the center and get their nectar out. So this plant does really well in shade to part shade. Um, so uh, I think this is a really great companion plant for other kind of woodland species like 
Columbine, brown leaf ground sole, um, just to name a couple plants that you might pair with it. Can oh yeah, Zizia, um, oh, yeah, this surrenders, which it's not blooming quite yet, but they look so cute together. Yeah. It will be blooming pretty soon. Think of like, for me, when I'm doing landscape design, I definitely think about um, textures. Um, also, of course, like the ecological value, but think about color combinations too. So imagine this bright yellow plant with this beautiful lavender uh, purple color. Um, and speaking of color of the plant, these uh, wild sweet williams can also have different color variation. And so um, sometimes they, they're a little more pink. Uh, sometimes they're like a cooler blue lavender. Um, I just think they're lovely. I remember growing up, my, my mom had these in her garden. Um, they're just so sweet. Um, and then the other cool thing about this plant is when the flowers die back, because again, they're only blooming in spring, right? So when they die back, they're left with uh, a semi evergreen ground cover, which I believe we saw all the way through the winter, didn't we, Alex? Um, yes, yeah, there's some phlox that definitely um, stays greener longer, for What's sure. What's the one that I'm thinking of? That you, oh, you, so we did see, we would have saw, uh, seen um, the, the, the foliage of these and um, another uh, phlox, a uh, woodland phlox, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that it, the foliage emerges before a lot of things. So it's a, something that's easy to ID vegetatively in the yeah. early spring. So that's what we've been seeing recently. Yeah, Real quick, I don't know if you can zoom in right here. I wanna show you how cute that little bloom is before it unfurls. <laughs> I know it's kind of hard to get like an up close still shot in the sun. In the sun. But anyway, this is a really cool woodland type species that you could add to your garden especially if you have um, an area that is mostly shaded but gets a little bit of sunlight um that's really great sometimes you need to find those like in between species yeah it's doing really well and this is definitely like not not super full sun but it's a lot it's a lot, yeah. it's a lot of sun yeah, yeah it's, it's probably gonna get shaded out here like what in an hour yeah probably so, about an hour yeah yeah um so yeah so this was one of our picks uh to show you all today it's such an easy garden plant it's so easy uh it's it's just the great pop of color that really means spring it does it feels like when i think of spring i definitely think of foxes like wild yeah. sweet william um so yeah definitely think about that adding that to your garden it's easily found at um native plant nursery absolutely and this one has a lot of cultivars so watch out you want to get oh, right. the yeah. straight native um always we always recommend getting the true natives yeah so phlox divericata don't don't get anything that has like a little x or a little like right or blue like blue sunset yeah or whatever <laughs> yeah but another yeah another thing to look for obviously the latin name is like a for me that's what i look for when i'm trying to find a true native plant um, but yeah, if it's, if it has a name in quotations, it's kind of frilly, it's probably not native. Um, yeah. or as Alex is saying, if the Latin name has an X, um, so that means it's a, a cultivar of yeah. that native plant. Uh, so stick to the true natives. And the reason why is because, um, pollinators have evolved with these plants for over thousands of years, millions of years. And if the genetic, um, genetics are modified, we don't really know how that affects the wildlife that depends on it. So it could affect the nutrition levels. Uh, the pollinators may not be able to easily identify if, it, if it's been genetically modified. Um, there's just a lot of reasons why it's probably not a great idea. So why risk it? Um, if one of your goals in your gardens is to support wildlife, stick with the true natives um, as much as possible. All right, should we move on to our next uh, plant? Yes. Or Sarah, actually, let's take a moment as we're walking. Yeah, we're good. We have a little bit of a walk here. Let's, if we have some questions. Yeah, that would, would be great. To. So just let us know, Sarah. Otherwise, sure. we'll be yammering. All right, thanks. Yeah, we have a few questions. Um, Val would like to know uh, before you walk away from there, what is surrounding the wild sweet William, the, uh, the grass there? Oh, uh, we don't want to talk about that. No, we will. Okay, we'll talk about it. It's, it's called river oats. Oh, no, this isn't river oats. This isn't river oats. Sorry. No, that's not river oats. Yeah, that is river oats. So what is this? Oh, there's a little bit of river oats, but this there's Indian grass. It's Indian grass. Okay. It's Indian grass. So both of these grasses, they are native, but they're really aggressive. Yeah. Um. So it's not an ideal grass to put in your yard because they just get too big and unruly. They spread a lot. Yeah. Uh, they do have ecological benefits, but let's keep them to 
yeah. probably more wild area. This, yeah, this bed is uh, slated to be redone, keeping the flux and the zizia, the um, golden alexanders. This whole patch will be blazing yellow pretty soon. Yeah. But but we do need to remove the grasses and the aggressive goldenrods out of this bed. Yeah, if you look beyond the creek there, that all of that is a um, river, river oat. oat yeah. Yeah. Monoculture, river oats. Yeah. It's, Don't do it. Don't plant river really oats. Cool plant. It's just too aggressive for most of our um, yards. So great question. Yeah. All right. Um, so thank you for that. While you are walking here, we will take another one. Um, Adrian would like to know if the wild sweet William will reseed itself easily. Will you talk about how to get it to do that? That's a great question. Do you want to take that one out? Yeah, it will reseed itself. Uh, leave the seed heads up. This is a plant that is so, I mean, diminutive. I don't mean that negatively, but it's, no, it's small, small compared to like a lot of native plants. <laughs> and so if you can leave the seed heads up on anything you want to reseed, I mean, that's the math. Seeds equal plants. Yeah. So just leave them up. They're really not, they're, they, they don't look like, um, a whole lot messy yeah, yeah they don't look messy if you if you leave them no. to dry out and you, you know if you think about it the way these plants function um i mean you could bust them and like try to plant them in pots and you could germinate them yourself but you might as well just leave them if you can on the seed head or on the, the plant itself um because it's going to drop out and spread the way that um, it's intended to in nature, right? Yeah. So, oh, and you actually just reminded me, Phlox divericata is an awesome potted native. It does oh, cool. really well in pots. That. Yeah, so I if you've got so a they... small space, yeah, the in one the up by the, in the courtyard, oh, one of great. our pots, uh, most of the things I've tried to plant in there have died, but the Phlox has done really well. Yeah. So that's an option for small gardens if you've got, if pots are your only option or part of your yeah. garden. So I'm kind of curious if, uh, Viewers, if you all have tried uh, growing native plants in pots, let us know in the chat. We'd yes. love to hear of some things that you've tried, what we fa we <laughs> yeah. failed. We failed a lot. I mean, that's part of growing, right? It so. really is. It really is. Okay, we're going to switch over here to thank you. All right, look at this. So we're here at Pin Oak Cove. And hello, <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> Alex, what are we going to talk about now? We're going to talk about some spring ephemerals and some native uh, woodland ground cover species. So the first one I wanted to talk about because it's such a great ground cover, although we might have it be a bit more showy later on in the year, is if you can come right down here, we can get them actually together. These are the two flowers I'm going to talk about. So this is Pacara. This is golden groundsel, Pacara aria. I mean, Pacara obovata. Yep. Yeah, Pacara obovata. <laughs> <They're>, oh, Latin. <laughs> yes, well, Latin. Um, and it will bloom out a, more than this. Like all of these flowers will have these little aster like um, flower composite flowers on the top. And then when they go to seed, they create like little dandelion type fluffy, fluffy seed heads. But the ground cover is what I wanted to really, the basil leaves of it is really what I wanted to promote here because um, there's this, this is a nearly evergreen um, shade uh, green mulch. So it, it will, it will spread in between nicely. And I don't know if you can see like how it, or you kind of just showed like how it's sort of spreading around the bluebells. Yeah, you see um, all this down here. Yeah, and it's spreading out uh, of this bed. And this is really nice because we have like a little Pacra nursery going right here so we can transplant stuff from here out. But I just love this as a green mulch. It's so cute. The flowers are so happy and smiley. We won't they're talk about really it too much because they're really not showing up. Well, but you know what I'm curious about? Can you talk a little bit about this environment that we're sitting in? So oh, like yeah. describe the conditions and, and just kind of like what we did during the fall to maintain the space. Yeah. So uh, this, this is our spring ephemeral showcase bed. And most of the plants in this bed um, are spring ephemerals. And spring ephemerals are flowers that do all their reproductive cycle in the early spring when the light resource is there because the trees haven't leafed out yet. So they get all of this done before the trees have fully leafed out. Um, and they die back usually in late spring, or early summer. So Pacara is technically not an ephemeral because it does stay green. Mm -hmm. um, it just flowers early, but 
an eph- a true ephemeral and one of the shining, like most iconic true ephemerals of our area are the bluebells. Mm-hmm. Um, this is bluebells, Virginia bluebells. And they're looking so gorgeous today. The flowers are starting. I, th- I said that they were probably in peak bloom maybe a few days ago. And the flowers mm-hmm. are just starting, starting to, to litter, bit. which is kind of cute. because They're really cute. cute. Sprinkles of blue all over the place. You know, they kind of remind me of like, they have this like tissue-like texture. Yeah. They kind of remind me of like flowy skirts or something like yes, that. Yes, they do. Um, but real quick, before we move on, um, can we talk a little bit about like um, someone in the audience mentioned that their PACRA is really aggressive. Um, so I just wanted to say that it, it does spread readily, um, but it usually does not uh, compete or overcompete with other plants. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. And 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 what I want from PACRA is for it to, to be aggressive. Right. Um, it's, it plays nicely with all of our ephemerals here. Ephemerals are notoriously kind of delicate flowers that don't like to be um, crowded. Typically they need a lot of space for themselves, some of them. And this packer is doing just fine. I've, right. n- I've never seen it kill off anything in here. So I would say just let it spread. Now you don't want to maybe plant tons of it around like new plantings, mm-hmm. like maybe keep it away from newer plantings, but with established perennial natives, um, they sh- it should play really nicely. There, yeah. And I should mention, there's another Pacra too. There's Pacra Aria that's um, better for sun. sun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's more of a sun um, ground song. Yeah, and then uh, something I think about too uh, when I'm designing a landscape bed, oh look, there's a little, someone's European honeybee is uh, pollinating it's mine. It's mine. that right there. Um, but anyway, so uh, Pacra is a ground cover species as Alex mentioned. And what that means is it's low growing, right? So when I'm doing a design, I usually save that for last as like a filler plant. So I start with the structural plants like trees and shrubs and bushes and whatnot, and then move to things like um, seasonal blooms. And then I fill in the gaps with this low growing Mm -hmm. um, plant. And that seems to work well to retain moisture and erosion and whatnot. So, oh, check it out. I didn't realize we got Wild Sweet William right here. Yeah, there's Wild Sweet William. And look, it's more purpley. Isn't it beautiful? It's so gorgeous. These all look really good together. Yeah, they do. Yeah, the pack and the pacra will open in like a few days and mm-hmm. there'll be so much yellow and with the purple and blue, it'll be so beautiful. Yeah. I don't know if you can see back there, but we have a white variant yeah, of the back here. Should we go look at that? Let's do it. And while we're looking at that, Sarah, if we have more questions from the audience, we'd love to answer them. Absolutely. We're looking forward to getting a pacra update next week, maybe. Yeah. Oh, look at the snake of bee. Sorry, go on. Val asks, uh, can either Pacara or Wild Sweet William be outcompeted by uh, common violets? That's a great question. Uh, Wild Sweet William could potentially be. I, so my thing with violets is I don't pick them out, but I also don't let them, if you're going to plant a new plant, um, clear out, give your new plant a bunch of space from violets. Um, violets, as in, in our experience, violets play nicely with well-established native perennials. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to plant new stuff directly into a violet bed without spacing it out a little bit. Yeah. I think uh, one piece of advice you gave me, Alex, because um, I, I asked the same thing a while ago about violets. And you said like if uh, to like weed out a buffer, like a yeah. little margin in between the plants yeah. uh, if if they're getting crowded yes for sure and i've done that a few times with things like um pussy toes i've had to do pussy toe rescues of yes <laughs> which is such a cool plant which maybe we can talk about next week on our next episode <laughs> there are so <laughs> many cool plants <laughs> yes uh but yeah we wanted we're gonna show you there's um there are bluebells so if you if you if you are able go out to your nearest um high quality woodland and you're going to see a lot of these flowers out there right now yes and um in one particular oh my gosh that's look at that cool bee. bee there sorry we're like we're, try, we're <laughs> trying to focus but there's this really cool native bee that's like black and white that we're seeing yeah, buzzing really cool. around we're seeing a lot of your oh my gosh bees, but also a lot of native bees um uh so uh yeah the uh they're typically blue obviously but yeah. they're they vary you can sometimes find in a sea of blue bluebells you can find um really lovely pink ones and then sometimes white ones like this yeah we call this white i guess it's like yeah i'd say close yeah yeah sarah do we have um another question before we 
we might we might have time to talk about one more plant depending on um, if we have any more questions or not. Um, so Kathy asks, I'm starting a new bed of natives in full sun. Do you have a recommendation for a green mulch uh, that would work well there? Yeah, yeah. Pacra so, aria for sure. Yeah, Pacra aria and um, pussy toes and yeah, pussy toes. Um, um, wild strawberry in a controlled setting. Be yeah, don't really a new bed, be so. careful with uh wild strawberry. Yeah, it's just too aggressive. It's a, it's a good native, but it's just not in the um, not in a great um plant to add I'm as like a though, starting. Man, I, I know. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, some do some hookahs do well in, or is that mostly shade? Yeah. Yeah, they're mostly shade. Oh, uh, no, Little Flower Alamur or Prairie Alamur is an awesome one. Uh, Selena, or uh, pa, um, Columbine. I'm trying to think of what. Uh, if you want to email us or um, uh, make a comment on Facebook, we can definitely send you a couple more Rose ideas. Rubina. Oh, we're Rose Rubina. Out. There we go. Now they're coming to us. It. We are in shade <laughs> mode. <laughs> So yeah, we'll probably talk about more Rose next Ver week. Yeah, next week we'll focus a little bit more on that. But Rose Verbena for sure, and pop. What did you say? Purple poppy purple mallow. poppy mallow would be great too. Yeah. Okay, so, we do want to talk about this. For, we have time. <laughs> Alex is so excited because I was like, "All right, let's try to focus on just a few plants. <laughs> if we have time, we could cram more in because so we many. there's so many great plants. All right, can y'all see this? This is celadine poppy. Yeah, and it's kind of a it. yeah thank you that one that'd be great that's it's, a prime looking flower yeah look at how beautiful that is so is this a real poppy alex that's what i'm wondering i don't know i don't know what i don't know either is, so. yeah look at that yeah. that's something uh, to think about um it might it might just be poppy It'd be poppy looking yeah. it's got like that little bulb too that's kind of the beauty of nature y'all i i feel like there's always things to learn and for me that's what keeps um things exciting for me and native plants and nature is that there's always more to learn. You can't, can't look too much. What, what, what do you see? Here we have one more flower really fast. <laughs> do we have time for one more? Which one are you looking at? Ginger. Oh yeah. Do you yeah, find, yeah. are they blooming? Sarah, do we have time? Always. Yeah. Let's I'm going to rip one off. I mean, oh, you don't have to. Okay. Me another flower. So, this is wild ginger here. I'm going to pull one of the flowers up because they're just so gorgeous. Can you see that? I hope you can just hold it there for a minute. So yeah, this is wild or yeah, wild ginger. And this is another great native shade ground cover. Um, so that flower there is very inconspicuous. It's on the bottom of the the leaf. As you can see, it's got like these heart-shaped yeah. leaves. It's mm -hmm. under the leaves. It's on the ground. The flowers are on the ground. So you really have to go look for it. But there's a reason it's on the ground. Yes. So that purple flower, it supposedly smells like rotten meat. And the reason for that, take a sniff, Alex. What do you think? Yep, it smells pretty bad. It smells pretty bad. So it attracts um, some of the earliest uh, pollinators, like flies. Believe it or not, flies are pollinators. Um, it also attracts ants. Um, they uh, collect the seeds and then eat. Uh, there's like a sweet uh, coating on the seed that the ants like. And then they take the seeds off to their little compost area. And then that's how they can also spread. Um, yeah, and so, that's how bloodroot spreads too. This one uh, right behind it. We're cramming too. more plants in. I'm sorry, but, <laughs> not, but being dispersed by ants is so awesome. It is so <laughs> awesome. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yeah, we've okay. got time for maybe one more question. Yeah. All right, thank you. Let's see. Julie would like to know if you have any tips for distinguishing Pacara obovata from Aria. Um, Pacra aria has a more dense flower cluster to it. Um, as far as the leaves go, I don't really know what the difference is. Um, but it's, uh, the easiest way to tell is by where it's growing. Yeah. You're not, aria is going to be in sun and, uh, obovata is going to be in shade. Well, mostly shade, because that, shade. the obovata we've got is in some good sun. I, I would argue Well, that, it's in sun now. That's true. But it won't be soon. This whole this whole area will be shaded. That's true. That's very true. Home, so yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. Pacara, I think, is one that's uh, more becoming more widely available um, uh, through native plant growers and 
uh, nurseries around town. I know we've bought it at Soil Service and Crit Site, I think, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Very good. Well, thank you all for joining us. Sarah, what, what do we all have to look forward to uh, coming up? All right. Thanks. Well, we've got some native plant programs at the Discovery Center, if I can get it up there on the screen. There we go. So, um, Alex and Sydney, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. So much fun. I've been really looking forward to us uh, getting to do some of these types of episodes where we can get out and walk around and look at plants with you. So we're really excited to um, be spending some more time outdoors at the Discovery Center um, with both of you. If you would like to learn more about the Native Landscape at the Discovery Center. Um, sign up for First Friday Landscape Chats. You'll want to take down the link on your screen here. Um, bring your mask and dress for the weather. Uh, this is the first Friday of each month. Alex or Sydney will guide you around the landscape, answer your questions. Um, registration is required for those and space is limited. So um, check out that website to get signed up. Um, so you can also check out, sorry about that. Uh, you can also check out the um, other upcoming events at the Discovery Center on that same link. Um, they have a Go Native program coming up on April 23rd. So uh, check that one out as well. After we close out the session today, please visit our website for more information. Um, I'd like to point out top left corner of the screen has a little button that says find plants. You can find more about upcoming native plant sales as well as local native nurseries um, and garden centers that may carry both natives and non-native plants. So um, please take a look at that. You can sign up for our newsletter, um, find out about upcoming events and more. While you're there, we'd be grateful for your donation to help us continue our work. So that's going to be all for today. We look forward to seeing you next week for a Native Plants at Noon special Earth Day celebration. Thank you, everyone. Take care.